whether it be Kentucky men's basketball's big road SEC opener win or home SEC opener win or Kentucky women's basketball's mixed uh, fortunes in conference play or kicking a player off the team. We got all that and more in today's episode of the Kentucky Colonel Sports Podcast. Let's get into it. Kentucky Colonel Sports Podcast. It is the spring semester. It's our first show of the semester, and I am your interim head host, Cole Park, back again. I'm joined by two familiar guests and one who you may not recognize. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? I'm Colton Johnson. I'm a sports reporter, well, I'm a staff writer for the Colonel, and I cover women's basketball. Um, I'm Jonathan Bruner, uh, just a reporter and cover baseball, but we're not talking about baseball. I'm Peyton Dybowski, and I help with the Colonel's media team. Awesome. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. Basketball season, unfortunately, we're going to have to reach a cutoff point. So let's start with conference play. Both the Kentucky men's and women's teams have kicked off conference play uh, to different results. Let's start with the men. Kentucky 2-0 in the SEC, 12-2 overall. Let's go back a little bit. Saturday, January 6th, inside Exact Tech Arena. Your final score was UK 87 Florida, 85. Antonio Reeves had 19 points. DJ Wagner had 14. Reed Shepard with 14. And Trey Mitchell with a 12.10 rebound double-double. Got some more figures to throw at you guys here, but first things first, what were your guys' initial takeaways from Kentucky and Florida? Well, I mean, I think going into their first like road SEC game, I think the environment was expected to get to these guys at some point. You know, as invincible as they've as they've looked, except for you know Wilmington and Kansas, I think there was always going to be a point where we saw a little bit of vulnerability, some mental mistakes. You know, they play good basketball, but there was a lot to left to be desired for me at that point. What about you, Jonathan? Um, I kind of feel like I think the main thing that I saw was growth. I think I look back to the Kansas loss and how they had a lead and then kind of weren't able to keep it. And then it just, once they lost the lead, it felt like they could never quite get back within like enough distance to where you actually felt like they could actually turn it around. And I felt like this game, it was, you know, it was close and they were able to, you know, clutch, they were able to clutch in the end and they were able to close out a big game on the road, you know, despite some of the mistakes and despite, uh, some other things that didn't maybe go so well, they were able to get it done at the end of the day, and that is one of the most important things that good teams have to be able to do no matter what. Absolutely. you have any comment? I agree with Jonathan completely. I think they were more persistent in wanting the, to strive and, like, gain that win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a game that Kentucky wasn't able to play its typical style of basketball. Throwing some numbers at you, the Wildcats went 5 for 20 from the three-point line. They were 1 for 10 in the first half. Six assists to nine turnovers, a team that had one of the best assist to turnover ratios in the country. Not great. UK led this game for five minutes and 25 seconds, pulled out the win, said a lot about the team and the resiliency. They come back home, and on Tuesday, January 9th, back home inside Rupp Arena at the Central Bank Center, your final score was UK 90, Missouri Tigers 77. What did you guys notice in that one? Well, I mean, I think throughout the whole game, we, I kept on expecting, you know, Kentucky was going to go on a stretch, Kentucky was going to open it up, and I, we never saw that. I mean, we know the caliber of team that Kentucky is, and I think people had this assumption that we were just going to come in there and walk all over Missouri. But Missouri had some good players. I mean, what was his name? I mean, Sean East, excellent player, had a great game. I, I think we've seen um, just kind of what we expected, maybe not as big of a win, like deficit-wise as we expected, but I think they kind of let Missouri hang around a little bit that could could have been problematic it wasn't so there's i don't feel a huge need to harp on it but um i think you know we saw in some impressive performances and they were able to get it done and move on to the next one which with in college basketball this year some teams have had problems with that and that's led to some upsets that are going to you know change a lot of things come march so i think that it was good on them to be able to you know just pull out the win, and even though they let it get a little too close at some times, a little close for comfort, they never let it get, like, too close to where a, a fatal mistake could have cost the whole game. 
Yeah, it felt like uh, in the Florida game, it kept feeling like Kentucky, it was a game of runs. Kentucky would get back, Florida would jump ahead, Kentucky would get back. This one, it felt kind of the opposite. I mean, there were certainly runs to be sure, but it felt like Kentucky got to about a 10-point lead and then just held it consistent, whether that be 9 points, 11 points. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. Rob Dillingham, 23 points, led the Cats in scoring 6 for 7 from the field, 3 for 3 from the three-point line in just 19 minutes. Trey Mitchell, 20 points, 14 rebounds. He was the first Wildcat to record a 20-point double double or 2010 double double since Oscar Shibway in the NCAA tournament against Kansas State. Wagner, DJ Wagner, had 16 points. Antonio Reeves had 14. The Wildcats went seven for 23 from the three-point line with 14 assists and 13 turnovers. Still a lot of turnovers, but back in the positives in the assist turnover ratio. Unlike Florida, where they led for five minutes, Kentucky led for 37 minutes and 37 seconds. It was you know, maybe not the the best looking win at all times, but simply put, Kentucky controlled the game. They put the keys in the ignition, and they never turned it off. Would you guys agree with that sentiment? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, I would. Well, the Cats' schedule doesn't quite get any easier as they move into SEC play. Let's preview the next two games they've got on the schedule. Saturday, January thirteenth, inside Reed Arena. That's at College Station, Texas, against Texas A and M. That one will be at two p.m. Eastern time on ESPN. The Aggies are currently favored by ESPN predictive metrics by 65%. What do you guys think? You know, I'll throw some more in-depth statistics going in here, but what is your guys' initial implication of Texas Tech? Uh, I mean, mean, I think they're they're a good squad. I think kind of just like Florida, I think they're, you know, I think they're a good team. I think Kentucky's not going to be able to just kind of, kind of like Missouri, I don't think, I don't see this being a game where they just come in and lead and they just, you know, throw up some shots and they just kind of head back to the house. I don't mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to be in like that. I think it's going to be in there. Uh, going to have to be locked in. They're going to have to um they're going to need some big performances from, you know, the consistent hands that have been there all year. They're going to need to play play well. They don't necessarily have to drop 40 or 50. They don't have to necessarily do that, but they, you know, they got to play good. I mean, I think that a- A&M is going to be one of the bigger challenges for them, but I do think that this team can definitely go in there and get a win. Because I think getting that win at Florida was huge for a road win because they're going to be able to play with a little more confidence on the road now, knowing that they can go into a hard place to play and get a win and find a way to win. And it says a lot being able to play different styles than they've been able to. It shows that they can adapt to their opponent, and I think that will help a lot in those more hostile environments. You know, coming into the season, especially after the run that they had last year in the SEC tournament, I expected Texas A&M to be one of the better teams in the conference. And I think for these young guys, it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for them to go on the road, control a game, you know, and really handily get a good win. Yeah, absolutely. The You mentioned that the, the Aggies entered the season number 15 in the country in the AP poll. They've since fallen to unranked. They're 9-6 and six overall, 0-2 oh in the SEC. So quite the opposite fortunes of Kentucky. Let's look at their losses real quick. They've got losses to FAU, Virginia, Memphis, and Houston out of conference. None of those really stick out as awful losses. I mean, FAU certainly has some questionable losses on the resume, as does Virginia, and Houston just took one to Iowa State. But, you know, none of those are bad losses per se. They get into conference play. They lose 68-53 to against LSU, not someone who's favored to be at the top half of the conference. And then they have a very understandable loss, 66-55 to against Auburn. Looking at their notable wins, they beat Iowa State, same one who just beat Houston, and they got a win at Ohio State. Um, their big three, three players averaging over double-digit point totals. Number one, and probably the most important player on this roster, um, arguably, is Wade Taylor IV. He's averaging 17.3 points per game, four assists, point, uh, assists per game. He's a junior, um, and he has, you know, had certain mixed fortunes once he got into SEC play. He had 23 against LSU, only 8 versus Auburn. He went 2 for 16 from the field against the Tigers. Other than him, though, they got Henry Coleman III, a former Duke Blue Devil. He's a senior. Uh, He averages 12.5 points per game, 8.4 rebounds per game, and he struggled against LSU, going 0 for 3 from the field with only 4 points, bounced back with 17 against Auburn. Finally, they got Tyrese Radford, a 5th-year senior, formerly a Virginia Tech Hokie. That's a turkey, if you don't know. There, he's averaging 12.2 points per game, 5.1 rebounds per game. He scored 11 versus LSU, 14 versus Auburn. But overall, something that's been very alarming for the Aggies, if you're a supporter, and something that may look good for Kentucky, let me throw some numbers at you, and I want to get your guys' opinion on this. Versus LSU, Texas A&M shot, what would you guess they shot from the field against LSU? 
Well, <laughs> guessing by how you're coming into this, I'm going to go low. I'm going to go like 28%. Uh, I'm on that same cinema, but I'll go 34. 32. 25% from the field against LSU. They did a little bit better against Auburn, 29%. But the fact of the matter remains, Texas A&M has not shot above 30% from the field in any game this season. Kentucky entered this game one of the best teams in the country in points per game. Um, despite that, the, the metrics aren't too bad against them. Ken Palm ranks the Aggies number 35 in the country with a 26 in offensive efficiency, 66 in defensive efficiency. Bart Torvik is a little bit more harsh at number 49, 32nd offensive efficiency, and 103rd in defensive efficiency. So um, interesting to note that it seems that offense has been their biggest struggle in conference play, but Historically speaking, this season, they're known as a more offensive-oriented team with defense letting them down. It'll be interesting to see which side comes out against Kentucky and if the Wildcats are able to counter. Certainly, you know, different players, especially some of the younger guys, had some struggles in Florida. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle that hostile atmosphere. I'm expecting Reed Arena to be jumping. I'll be down there with assistant sports editor Ali Chetznak. Probably going to leave out for that one on Friday. Um... As we get into a couple of these, there's a few games that will be coming up. We're recording this on a Wednesday, so um, certain things have not happened yet. Certain things will have happened by the time this episode is published. I'll mention that when it comes up. After that, Wednesday, January 7th, back home inside Rupp Arena, the Wildcats host Mississippi State at 7 p.m. These are all Eastern time. That'll be on ESPN2. UK is favored 73.9% by ESPN. What are your guys' early thoughts on the Bulldogs you know I got the opportunity to watch them when they played South Carolina most recently and I can say I mean they play defense down there in Starkville and it's no joke that's kind of how they branded their basketball and something they've always lacked is perimeter shooting and I think they've gotten a little bit of that through Josh Hubbard he's been really good on the offensive like uh, point for them but I think it'll be a good test for Kentucky just for Kentucky's offense you know it's been so consistent it's been so potent and I think it's a good defense and it's going to give them a good run Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that I think uh, if they're able to go down to College Station and get a win, I think that it, this could this could be a trap game, so to speak, because like Colton said, they do have a really good defense, and if Kentucky comes in unfocused and is really cold, then it could uh, lead to an, an unfortunate loss in a game, like you said, that they're pretty heavily favored in percentage-wise. So, you know, I think that, while Kentucky, you would think, would be able to handle it, it could be a hangover after a big win that could set up to be a tough a tough loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely think that Kentucky needs to be more calm on the offensive end and definitely connect and like communicate with each other. I think that'll definitely help when going against uh, Mississippi's uh, really good defense. So. Absolutely. Jonathan, you talked a little bit there about uh, disappointing losses. Mississippi State knows a thing or two about that. The Bulldogs are 11-3 and overall, 0-1 in the SEC. They're set to play number 5, Tennessee, tonight at home. The line is currently UT minus 2.5. They're favored by ESPN. The Vols, the Vols, for all intents and purposes, are favored at Mississippi State. So most likely, assuming we get chalk tonight, they'll be 0-2 in the SEC. They'll host Alabama on Saturday. But let's look at their resume real quick. 11-3 and three overall. Some of their more notable wins, they got a win at, uh, over Rutgers and Northwestern, which also boasts a win over likely to drop number one Purdue. But their losses, they lost at Georgia Tech, 69 or 67-59. to 59. They lost at South Carolina, 68-62. to 62. And they lost at home against Southern University. That was 62-59. Quite the stunning loss, similar to Missouri, that Kentucky just beat with the loss to Jackson State there. Uh, not one you want to see on your roster. Yeah. Mississippi State has two players scoring above 10 points per game. They're led by Tolu Smith, 14.5 points per game, 6.5 rebounds per game. He is a fifth-year senior, uh, spent one year in Western Kentucky. Shout-out to our Hilltoppers. He averaged 15.7 per points per game last year for the Bulldogs. His, his numbers are a little bit down, but he's still got time to lift it up. Other than that, they got freshman Josh Hubbard. He's got 14.4 points per game. Interestingly... Similar to Kentucky, both of those players, two of the best players on the team, come off the bench. Neither started in last game against South Carolina. Simply put, though, it was not acceptable against the Gamecocks. You mentioned you watched that a little bit. They scored 68 points. Both scored 13 in that game, both Hubbard and Smith. The starters scored a combined 32 points. So not what you want to see from your starting rotation. 
Uh, but despite that, maybe a little bit of computer trickery going on here, some metrics getting a little bit fooled. The Bulldogs are ranked higher than the Aggies in both metrics. Ken Palm ranks them number 28 with the number 10 defense in the country and the number 110 offense in the country. As for Bart Torvik, they're ranked number 32 with the 78th offensive efficiency and 12th defensive efficiency. So quite the opposite, actually, uh, to Texas A&M. They're more favored on the defensive side of the ball, ranked in the top 15 in both metrics. So uh, look for that one. You know, Kentucky's known for its electric offense. Mississippi State will look to try to shut that down. We've been going for a little bit now, but we got to move over to the other side of the basketball court, the women's basketball team. Kentucky women's basketball currently stands 1-1 one one in the SEC, 8-8 eight eight overall, <laughs> less than stellar overall record, and surprisingly solid SEC record for what we would have projected at this point in the year. Let's start with conference play. Thursday, January 4th, inside Rupp Arena, one of three home arenas the women's basketball team has this year. It was UK 73, Arkansas 63. Quite the staggering result. Asia Petty with 22 points, 19 rebounds. Brooklyn Miles with 12 points. And Emma King, Kentucky veteran, 10 points. What did you notice, Colton? I believe you were there, if, you, if I'm correct. You were there. What did you guys notice in that one? Both of you guys have covered Kentucky women's basketball quite a bit in this winter break for college students here. So one of our reporters, Josh Smith, was there with, Josh Smith was there with me, and we kind of had this consensus along with other media there that Kentucky was probably going to get scraped. They had Talia, Arkansas has Talia Scott. Leading the SEC with 23 points per game coming into that game. Sailor Poffenbauer was leading the SEC in rebounds, and everyone was like, well, let's just get through this and get home. But, I mean, after the first quarter, there was by no means a gap. It was bad basketball, but it was, I think, it was either 4-8 to eight or 6-8 to eight after the first quarter, a whopping 14 points. And that was kind of the narrative that everyone there had. Like, it was a win, but was it really a win? You know, it was – it came down to the free throws at the end – they re- did really well against Talia Scott, but Arkansas went into the half 0 for 13 from three points. And that this is a team that led the SEC in three-pointers per game. So relying on a team to be off in order to get a result, I'm, I hate the nitpick, but though they won, I was not that impressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of agree. I um, I kind of had the same sentiment as Colton and other media members there. I wasn't there, but I um about they were probably not going to come out on top on that one. And then um, I was just uh, trying to find something to watch. I just checked the score real quick, and it was, like, really close. I don't remember exactly when it was. I want to say it was, like, sometime in the third quarter-ish, maybe, somewhere. But anyways, the score was a lot closer than it should have been. And then once I turned it on, I kind of echoed all those same sentiments. as like it was very sloppy, and um, but – a win is a win, and they were able to close out the game and get a win, and um, that's about all there was to it. You know, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You move on from that one. Well, one more thing on that game real quick before we – it kind of contradicts the next one or contrasts the next one, rather. Like you guys mentioned, it was an off game for the Razorbacks, and I know I spoke with Josh as well after that one. He shared the similar sentiment that it was definitely an off day for the Razorbacks. Arkansas shot 36.8% from the field. Kentucky was around 55%. It was a surprisingly good offensive showing for a team that hasn't really been great offensively all year long. Uh, You move into Sunday, January 7th, inside Thompson Bowling Arena. We had Tyler Russell in person for that one. That was uh, University of Kentucky 69, University of Tennessee 87. A lot more of a scoreline people expected to see from the Wildcats moving into SEC play. Asia Petty had 14 points, 14 rebounds. Maddie Shear with 13 points. And Saniya Tyler with 10. But the leader, Anaya Russell, with 16 points. On the contrast, it was Kentucky this time shooting 38% from the field. Tennessee shooting 15% or 53% from the field, not 15. Inside their home arena, what did you guys kind of notice in that one? And what do you guys need to see from Kentucky going forward after this loss? Well, I mean, initially... There was a lot of momentum going into halftime. I mean, heck, they were up by 10. You expect to carry a double-digit lead going into the break into a victory, but, I mean, it was anything but. I think Kentucky kind of got insp- exposed in the sense that they can at times be very one-dimensional and one-dimensional and going through everything going through Asia Petty. You know, they, and they can't be that, especially when they're coming up with the team that they're going to be playing and the talented bigs that they have. And I remember Asia Petty saying at the in the press conference that the crowd didn't rattle them and they kept the same intensity, and I don't I don't know if I can agree if you go from winning by 10 to losing by 18. 
Yeah, I mean, I well, um, had the beginning of the game on, and then when they, I was kind of, you know, like, wow, I didn't didn't really see this one coming. They kind of, you know, really jumped out to a lead and were just playing really well. And then all of a sudden, it just was just gone. It completely just fell apart. And I think Colton nailed it. They they get very one dimensional at times. And when you play good teams, it doesn't matter how many you're up by. Once you start to get one dimensional and they start to stop it, if you don't have an answer, then it's going to end up exactly like it did. So the end result with how the game went was not surprising because it was really two completely different halves. And once Tennessee was able to kind of crack the code and uh, slow the Kentucky offense down, it was um, all downhill from there. So looking forward, I think that they got to figure out a more balanced offensive approach to prevent things like that from happening because already when you're kind of behind the eight ball as far as being favored and stuff, you're going to have to make up some games. And you're not going to be able to do that by relying on one player to be your entire offense. It's just simply not going to happen. I just think it all comes down to consistency and like being being able to just communicate as a team when you're going into the second half. You have this great lead on a women's team who is notorious for being good in the environment in the Tennessee arena for them. And they kind of just let it go and didn't really seem like they wanted to win. Absolutely. This was a homecoming game for head coach Kira Elsey. She used to play for the Tennessee Volunteers under Pat Summit. But that was not the biggest piece of Kentucky women's basketball news out of the last few days. We got the news yesterday. That was Tuesday. Zaniah Thomas, sophomore Kentucky basketball player, is dismissed. She is off the team. More importantly, this is the second time in a three-year span after Aaron Toller in 2021 that a player has been kicked off the Kentucky women's basketball team. Not at all the first time a player has been suspended either. We had Drayana Edwards last year. Um, it says a lot about, I think, the culture of this program, and I, I know you guys have some points to speak to about this. Um, I'll throw a few more numbers at you guys real quick, and I want to – first say like this is not Maddie Shear getting kicked off the team by any stretch of the imagination mm -hmm. Zania Thomas averaging two points per game 1.7 rebounds and 0.1 assists per game she last played on November 25th in Kentucky's 65 to 41 loss against Cincinnati in Paradise Jam she was suspended indefinitely going into the Boston College game and had not played or been with the program since she has now been formally dismissed from the team UK said there will be no further comment at this time but Kicking players off the team is not where it seems to stop for the problems of this women's basketball team. You've seen every single season under Kira Elzey, players are leaving this program, whether that be Drayana Edwards, as we just mentioned, most famous for hitting the game winner over, at the time, undefeated South Carolina to win the SEC title, first time Kentucky had won one in 40 years, two years ago. Jasmine Massengill, Treasure Hunt, point guard Jada Walker, Kennedy Cambridge, one of the more highly touted recruits Kira Elzey brought in last year. She's gone. What do you guys think is the issue with this program? Why do players not want to play for Kira Elzey? And when they do, why can they not stay out of trouble? You know, you hate to point fingers, and especially when it's at a person that plays as significant as a role as a coach. But, I mean, I don't think, you know, results matter. And when it comes to a player, and that is, she may not have played that much. That's very true. But Kentucky was slim enough at the forward position to begin with. They don't have anyone else that's healthy, other than freshman Janae Walker. Niall Everett is still coming back. But every time, I, I, it seems like every time that Kyra Elsie comes out into a press conference, we get the same answers. And I, every time I begin to wonder if she, it's kind of like she discredits all the, all the things that go wrong for them on the court, off the court to something that just has nothing to do with it. So... I mean, I couldn't really tell you because they're not going to, we'll never learn what she did. If it was anything to do with the team or if it was something that she did away from the team. But something's very, very wrong with this women's basketball team. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the age old addict in sports is you represent the team on and off the court. And I think that if you're constantly running into these disciplinary issues, that it's going to immediately reflect back on the coach. And it should. A coach drives the culture by bringing in people who they think will fit the desired culture that they want. And when players buy into a culture and then it's not met, that's why they leave. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of players don't leave programs that they're recruited to. You know, it, some players leave because of playing time and, you know, whatever it may be, but most players leave Kentucky for the draft. 
they don't leave Kentucky for other reasons other than going pro. So it's it definitely calls into question some things. Like Colton said, we'll never really know what happened, so it's hard to kind of really point fingers back and forth. But I think that's a reflection of coaching or lack thereof when it comes to certain things. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, representing the team on and off the court is something that is preached in all sports at all levels. So um, I think whether it was on the court or off the court, that it, it it's going to show back on LZ in a big way and in a negative way, I mean, as it should. But uh, there's just um, a lot going on that is – so much different than you know issues on the court and I feel like it very much takes away from what's on the court and I think that's very problematic as well but just when it comes down to disciplinary stuff it's a direct reflection of the coach because the coach is the reason why a player is here and just like they can be the reason why a player leaves as well. I definitely agree I think it's almost like false advertising it's like this program looks so great and then when you're immersed into it and you want to leave or you're doing something to get you I guess potentially kicked off it's like what actually went wrong what was the difference compared to what you presented the player in the first place absolutely it's hard to win games on the court when you keep losing off the court things don't get any easier for the women's basketball team they've got two games upcoming before we go live next well I don't know why I said that we're not a live show but before we go on air next Thursday January 11th inside Rupp Arena Kentucky will host Vanderbilt. That'll be 7 p.m. on the SEC Network Plus. Vanderbilt is 15 and one overall, with the one loss to number five NC State. That was 70 to 62. They are two and zero in the SEC with wins over Mississippi State and Florida. Followed that one up with a Monday, January 15th, inside Colonial Life Arena. That is the home of number one South Carolina. That'll be at 7 p.m. on the SEC Network. South Carolina is 14-0 in the country with four ranked wins, 2-0 in the SEC, ironically also over Mississippi State and Florida. What are you guys looking for in these two games? Well, with Vanderbilt initially, I mean, even outside of the conference, they've had some shared opponents. I remember when uh, before the Lipscomb game, I was looking at some of their opponents, I mean, uh, and Lipscomb had also played Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt beat them by 22. Kentucky beat Lipscomb by 7. And if you watch that game, Lipscomb was in that thing the whole time. So Vanderbilt, when it comes to forward play and Kentucky playing through Asia Petty, I think they'll have an opportunity. Uh, I think anything down low goes through Sacha Washington and Vanderbilt. So when it comes to mismatches, I think they definitely got one there. And when it comes to South Carolina, I think there's kind of one narrative and one narrative only, you know. Yeah, uh, I kind of echo the same thing. Um, I think they definitely have a chance against Vandy. I think they got to play, uh, I mentioned before, they got to play a lot more balanced. It's going to be it's gonna be hard to win anything when you just rely on one player to do everything. It's going to be hard to win any time in any sport. And, you know, I think if they uh, are able to accomplish a more balanced approach, then I think they'll have a good chance against Vanderbilt. I think they'll, they would be able to get, uh, get that one, but... Uh, South Carolina, they are South Carolina and the number one team in the country for a reason. 6-7, Camille Cardozo. Yeah. Multiple yeah. national championships in recent memory as well. Yeah. I mean, what more can you say? That's that's a program that is not slowing down anytime soon. I want to do a little new segment here as we wrap things up. That's all of the analysis we got for this episode. But we discussed four upcoming games. We talked about a couple previous games. Let's do our post-show pickums. I'm going to go each and every one of you give me a pick for each one of these games. Let's start first up, Kentucky at Texas A&M on Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN. Colton, who you got winning that one? I'm going to go with the Kentucky Wildcats. I think they'll handle business. I have no doubt in them. Jonathan? I agree. I'm going to say Kentucky, and I think Rob is the leading scorer. Really? Yeah. Peyton? I definitely think Kentucky, but I, I think it's going to be a close game, to be honest. Well, considering I'm planning on keeping track of all of these figures, I'm going to have to be the odd one out. I'm going to go, as much as it pains me to say, I'm going to go Texas A&M Aggies. They're favored at home by ESPN. I assume Vegas is going to favor them as well once that line comes out. So Vegas tends to know things I don't. Trust me, my wallet knows that as well. (laughs) Um, I'm going to go Texas A&M at home, get the win. Their best win of the season it will be. Kentucky, a respectable loss to a Quadrant 1 opponent on the road. Keeping track of these scores, just to be different, I'm going to go Texas A&M. Moving on, Kentucky 
hosting Mississippi State Wednesday, January 17th on ESPN2. Colton. You know, Cole, I don't think you have to worry about betting against the Wildcats on this one because I am going to go with the Mississippi State Bulldogs. I think they're going to have plenty planned. I mean, I think it's an offense that you have to – they're going to spend a lot of time in the film room, and they're going to spend a lot of time preparing for the Kentucky Wildcat team, and I think they're going to have something for them. I think they're going to get a shocker and rep. Jonathan? I could definitely see that, but I – because, you know, the thing with Kentucky is that you're always going to get the other team's best game. They're doing whatever they can to try to knock you down because you're the John Calipari-led Kentucky Wildcats, and that just – it kind of is what it is. But I do think win or loss on Saturday – that they're able to pull this one out at home. I think they're able to get it done, so I'm going to say Kentucky on that one. Peyton? I disagree. I think Mississippi State, I think that they have such a strong defense and we're really offensive base in comparison that I don't think we're going to be able to pull out the win. See, me, I'm looking at it. Kentucky's a team that's capable of losing to UNC Wilmington at home. Mississippi State's a team that's capable of losing to Southern at home. Looking at the atmosphere of Kentucky-Missouri, in side rep arena i'm taking the wildcats i think inside their home arena with a great crowd kentucky will in my opinion bounce back from a tough loss on the road with a great game at home expect rob with the shifts as he's called <laughs> to have a great one in that one <laughs> moving over to the women's side on thursday january 11th on the sc network plus kentucky hosts vanderbilt who do you got you know i'm gonna have the wildcats going back over 500 in the sec i think they're gonna get it done i mean i have I'm going to leave it at that. But, but Maddie Schur, she's had, she's had questionable performances, especially with the Arkansas game. She didn't have a field goal three for three, from, uh, four, three for four from the free throw line, though. But I think she's going to have a bounce back game. I think they're going to play through Asia Petty. They're going to play their brand of basketball, and I think they'll get it done against the Commodores. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree. I, I think they do find a way. I think they, you know, to have any hope at a productive season, they're going to have to have these games where they actually have a chance. Because when you play the South Carolinas, you play LSU, you play those powerhouses, it's going to be – you're just outgunned at the end of the day. So they're going to have to be able to pull these types of games out, and I think they will. I think they're going to – I think they'll find a way. I'm leaning more towards Vanderbilt winning. I don't – I don't know. After everything that's happened, I just think everyone's judgment's really clouded on the team, and I don't know what the coach is thinking, and I just don't think they're going to be able to come together and get a win. I hate to be a hater. I really do. I got to reiterate that point early on. But I look at 15-1. and one. I look at 2-0 and oh in the SEC. I look at a close loss against a top-10 NC State team. I got to go with the Commodores here. I just don't see Kentucky being able to pull this one out. I know it's a home game. I think it out of the two we're going to talk about, it's the more winnable. Um, I think that they have a chance. I, I'm not saying that I would be absolutely stunned if Colton's prediction comes true, but I am going with the Commodores. Let's go yeah. Cornelius Vanderbilt. Shout out to that man. Man who built America. <laughs> Throw back to high school social studies well, Let's class. talk about the good part, too. Okay. <laughs> Monday, January 15th, inside Colonial Life Arena, number one undefeated South Carolina versus your Kentucky Wildcats. Who do you got, Colton? Well, uh, I see an absolutely horrific matchup down the – I mean, Petty has been playing – has had a sensational season. She's averaging a double-double. But there's only so much you can do when your opponent is 6'7", and her name is Camille Cardozo. Like I, you know, you want to you want to have some sliver of hope. You know, anyone can, anybody can beat anybody at the, at the end of the day. But in these past couple of years, we've seen very few opponents best the Gamecocks, and I'm going to go with the Monsters. So yeah, I mean, I'm going to say South Carolina as well. I just think even if Kentucky is able to catch them for an off quarter or something, just something happens where this game is very close and tight. I think the Tennessee game is going to strike again, and they're not going to be able to hold South Carolina down long enough to make it competitive. So I'm going to say South Carolina. I just have the game Cox. No further comment. <laughs> just <laughs> fair. That's fair. I think when you look around the sport of college basketball and college sports more broadly, there is just such a famous storied history of all time coaching matchups. You have. You know, in the football side, recent retiree Nick Saban, Kirby Smart. You had John Calipari, you know, Coach K at Duke, all these matchups. Don Staley, Kyrie is not one of those matchups. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going with the Gamecocks, and I think that's all that really needs to be said about that yeah, one. No odd one out yeah. here. Um, not quite 
the same standard as those other matchups we discussed. Well, that's all from us on this episode. Uh, We look forward to seeing how all of these games turn out and how our predictions hold up. I'm sure, I mean, considering we didn't agree on all games, some of us will be wrong. And some of us will have to live with that eternal shame That's for right. that. Absolutely. Colton will be continuing to cover women's basketball. You can find him on Kentucky Colonel's Twitter or X account. You can also find him on our website, Colton Johnson. Jonathan will be our baseball beat head once that season starts up. In the meantime, he's been filling in, doing a lot of good work with the women's basketball team and other teams who need that uh, coverage. So you can look for him on the same places as we just said. As for Peyton, hope to see her more on this show, and we'll be also on the Colonel's socials. As for me, I'm everywhere. So <laughs> That's right. we'll get out of here. <laughs> That's right. Did you like this episode of the Kentucky Colonel Sports Podcast? You can listen to it and more on all places you find podcasts, Spotify, and on our website. That's kycolonel.com. Be sure to check out our work and the work of all of our lovely guests who come on and of our other desks as well. I'm your host, Cole Park, and we'll see you guys next time.